I think it's probably going to be useful for us to start with a definition. Jewish philosophy is not synonymous with Jewish thought in general. It's very specific. I know that the word philosophy in popular culture gets bandied about. Every taxi driver you meet has a philosophy. But really, the sort of philosophy we're talking about specifically is not actually a Jewish exercise. Philosophy starts with the Greeks, as you would know. Philosophia, the love of wisdom. Philosophy is concerned with what can we know about reality and what can we know about the world and what can we know about ourselves in that reality using this very, very interesting, precise instrument in our heads called our mind. What can we as human beings using rational thought deduce about the world and about anything that concerns us. So it's not really a Jewish exercise because Jews have never really been bothered. I mean, it's not like Jews have not prided the intellect and rational thought. We're going to touch on that. But our fundamental source of knowledge within the continuum of Jewish thought doesn't come from rationality but comes from revelation. That the Word of God was revealed to the Jewish people and other spiritual systems throughout humanity's history, and that is the real source of knowledge. Yet, at the same time, there's no question that the products of human thinking throw up challenges to Jewish thought. They throw up challenges to revelation. So in that sense, Jewish philosophy, while it's not generic to Jewish thought, is extremely important because it effectively becomes the first line of contact, the first line of defense, if you like, on behalf of revelation, on behalf of the purpose of the Jewish people against rational insight. Does everybody understand what I'm saying there? If revelation, for example, tells us that God created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh, that is an idea that we know from the Bible, that's a revealed idea. The idea, however, that that universe, both in form and matter, is created from nothing, is a philosophical idea. It's an intellectual, rational, deductive idea that comes from our response to ideas about where do form and matter come from in this universe. Philosophy really begins with the Greeks. Now, Plato wants, to, wants us, in a sense, to make a mental movement away from this corrupted, pluralistic world that we see to contemplate another world, a more transcendent realm that he calls the realm of ideal forms. The problem with Plato is that for Plato, there is a distinct dualism that arises between this transcendent realm of ideal forms and this reality in which we are existing. There's no real connect between the two. Aristotle, on the other hand, is wanting us to make a mental movement into reality, to look at the world around us and to understand universal forms by seeing reality for what it is and by, most importantly, categorizing it. A mental movement away from this corrupted pluralistic reality, a mental movement into this diverse universe. Plato and Aristotle, I mean, Aristotle's living in the 4th century BCE. Plato in the 5th century BCE. So the first person that we call the first Jewish philosopher is not living until the 1st century CE. And he's living in Alexandria, the New York of his day. And I'm talking, of course, about Philo. 
Philo's main contribution was never really picked up by Jewish thought. It became very big in another religion that will become clear in a second. Now, Philo, as a middle Platonist, with this part of the school of a few hundred years after Plato, they call the middle Platonists, is concerned with this connect. It's, a, it's easy for Platonists to say, oh, realm of pure ideas and pure forms, that's the divine realm at the top of Plato's hierarchy, right at the top of the re in the realm of universal forms is the idea of the good. That's God, no problem. We can match it all together. But how do we connect the two? How do we connect that with this reality? And it is Philo's idea that what connects these two is the embeddedness of God's revealed creative will incarnated in form in the world by revealed word that he calls the Logos. Now you can see now why the Logos as a connector between the higher transcendent realms and this one becomes very big in another religion because that means that Philo is able to talk about the incarnation of the divine. That's why it's no coincidence. And I don't normally say this, so please don't tell anyone I said this, but that's why it is no coincidence the early church fathers were very, very interested in Philo, and even the book of John starts with the idea of, uh, you know, in archi in logos, in the beginning was the word. But we're, so we already have this idea of the revealed word that God is actually able somehow to be embedded and incarnated in word in the world and God's world is a creative power and that's the connector. But really that's not so much a Jewish idea as a Jewish philosophy. He's an extremely interesting person. Philo was a spiritual leader of an entire Jewish community in Alexandria. Very interesting historical figure for other reasons. But the whole story of what we now call Jewish philosophy doesn't really begin till seven, eight hundred years after Philo. For the purposes of this, so people don't get confused, I'm going to draw a timeline and I'm going to call this, uh, I'll call this now, around about 2000, uh, I'll call this 1000, 1500, so I'm going to start here around about the year 900. Uh, in the 800 or so years since Philo, there are no real contributions to what we call Jewish philosophy to speak of. We were not really concerned about the challenges brought up by rational thought. We were reasonably busy doing other things. And not only were we going through tremendous upheaval in the Jewish world after the destruction of the temple in the first century and then major, major waves of exile and persecution. But even on an intellectual level for the entire 800 years before here, we were editing the final books of the Bible. We were uh, developing entire genres of literature such as Midrash and wisdom literature. We were dealing with intellectual challenges such as Gnosticism, Manichaeism, Zoroastrianism. We had two major world religions come out of us, Islam and Christianity. We were busy. <laughs> but we really didn't turn around to react to what was going on until a point not long before here. Because where was, who was really carrying the torch of intellect and the torch of learning at this time was the Islamic world. They had some very impressive products intellectually. And one of those products, of course, was the entire school of Islamic philosophy that was attempting to weld and incorporate the consequences of Greek philosophical thought with a revealed religion, which is Islam. And eventually, and that, that all of those schools of thought in Islam, in Islam, that sort of medieval philosophical schools that we do not have time to go into the details of today, it's very important, but it's called the Kalam. 
the Kalam, philosopher, Islamic philosophers are coming to Jews and they're saying, ah, oh, you have a corporeal God. Allah is purely reified and abstract. But if you read your Bible, your God has hands and ears and eyes and a body. He's a dude. You don't really have a transcendent incorporeal God. Now, that's an example, a very, very clear example of what I was saying in the introduction to this talk about a challenge coming from rational philosophical thought that the Jewish people have to suddenly wake up and take cognizance of. And of course, when we have those sorts of challenges, the universe seems to have a way of providing the response. And so the first big philosopher that we can only touch upon for a minute, but is Sa'adja ibn Yusuf al-Fayyumi, otherwise known as Sa'adja Gaon. Sa'adja's contribution to Jewish philosophy, if we have to really, really whittle it down, lies in the following. Sa'adja tells us that when it comes to these questions, revelation and reason must accord. They must accord. If I receive something in revealed tradition, which I definitively know to be irrational, I can reject it. Whoa. That is not the same as saying, if I have something in revealed tradition, and I don't understand it, I can reject it. That's a very different thing. But if it doesn't make sense to my rational intellect, I can reject it. He brings several famous examples. He rejects, for example, this new idea that was evolving in the Jewish thought and since evolved greatly, since Saja, in the mystical tradition, the idea of reincarnation. Saja rejects it. But Saja's big, big, big contribution to this reconciliation between rational and revealed thought is so embedded in the way we think that we sometimes take it for granted we don't even realize it. And that is, because we know through rational thought and through our, the, our intellectual and reasoned understanding that God does not have a body, that God is abstract and incorporeal, I therefore know that all of the descriptions of God that are embodied in physical descriptions must be allegorical. They must be. And I don't say they must be because I want to be a nice Jewish boy and I don't want God to have a body. They must be. And he spends chapters and chapters explaining the intellectual rationale behind why that must be. It's very obvious to us today, that idea, but it wasn't obvious then. And in fact, every time someone comes to you and tells you that the word of God must be read literally, then you can say to them, so what are you saying? God has hands, God has a head, God has a voice, God has eyes. These must be understood allegorically. Sadia's immense contribution that in no small measure also kicked off, in a sense, the Jewish mystical tradition which then attempts to understand what these allegorical modes of the divine actually are. What do the, ha the hands of God obviously mean the power of God in the world, the eyes of God mean the providence and supervision of God in the world, and so on. This is Sarge's idea that revelation and reason must accord, an idea that we take for granted today, is an immense contribution. But by the time we get to the 12th century, the 10th and late 10th and early 12th centuries, there is a sudden discovery that of the writings of Aristotle and whereas Plato had been the dominant thinker until that point, we start to see a revival of Aristotle. Before that happens, 
We had, of course, gone after Sajja through an entire journey into Platonic and Neoplatonic thought. What is Neoplatonic thought? Neoplatonic thought attempts, because when you hear the term Neoplatonic, it sounds very fascinating and fancy, but what it really means is, once again, the project of connection between the transcendent realm of ideas and this corrupt reality. The Neoplatonists basic answer in the few preceding hundreds of years that was very influential on all religious thought, but especially on Jewish thought, is the idea of emanation. The Neoplatonists saw not God as one, but virtually the number one as God, and that all substrata of reality were emanated in a series of more and more corrupt gradations until you get to the bottom of the emanatory process where everything's really, really so bad and corrupted from the divine that it actually takes on physical form that contains evil, and that means this world. One of the greatest texts written in the Middle Ages on the concept of unfolding of the principles of how form and matter, which represent mass male and female divine energies intertwining and fusing with the penetration of the soul, a very, very complex Neoplatonic schema, is written in a book that was known in Latin as the book called Fons Vitae, the source of life. The Fons Vitae was known as this probably the most pure Neoplatonic text written in the Middle Ages, but no one knew who had written it. It was, in fact, thought to have been written by an unknown Islamic or Christian philosopher, and it wasn't until the 19th century that they discovered through archival and other evidence that the Fons Vitae was, in fact, none other than the book Makor Chayim, The Source of Life, written by the great Neoplatonic philosopher and poet of the 11th century, Shlomo Ibn Gbirol. Shlomo Ibn Gbirol is not merely a street in Tel Aviv. He was, in fact, the greatest Neoplatonic philosopher. So he's sitting somewhere here. And he's not just another Jewish philosopher. It turns out he's actually probably the purest Neoplatonic thinker in all of Western thought in the Middle Ages and has tremendous impact, once again, on the mystical. There are two strands from here onwards. Two strands are distinct in Jewish thought. The rational, the philosophical, which is dealing with the challenges thrown up by rational thought generally, and the mystical. In the mystical, we're not so reactive. In the mystical, we're much more dealing with revelation. Books like the Zohar and so on, which sets off the whole train of Kabbalah, emerge and are revealed here. But we're focusing tonight on the immensely important project of Jewish philosophy. So, uh, here we start to see the rise of Aristotle, as a, a revival of Aristotle. And people are very excited about Aristotle. Aristotle's super, super impressive. I mean, he really is. He was impressive then, and he's impressive now. He may have got some things wrong. His map of understanding of reality on a, what we would call a scientific level, may be highly outdated, but he's super impressive in his methodology, in his reasoning. Aristotle, remember, gives us the basic axiomatic syllogisms and underlying philosophical frameworks that have never really been dated, and by which the whole order of logic in Western thought is built up. And so if he was impressive now, you imagine in the Middle Ages, you suddenly discover Aristotle, you're going to get very excited. And of course, that then leads us to the greatest of the medieval Jewish philosophers, and I'm talking, of course, about Maimonides, uh, otherwise known uh, as the Rambam, of Moshe ben Maimon, who writes, come now, the Maimonides, as you know, towering figure, right? So he's the greatest rabbi of not only his generation, but of numerous generations on either side. He's also the greatest physician of his age, and Saladin and Richard I are debating over who's going to be, who's going to have the Rambam as their personal physician. But he's also a ginormous philosophical mind. 
And I, as I'm fond of saying, you know, the Christian church is not really in the habit of giving out medals to Jewish philosophers living in Islamic countries in the Middle Ages, but they have time for the Rambam. Aquinas, in fact, uh, admits how much of his own thought is, is in debt to the Rambam. The Rambam loved Aristotle, just thought he was the bee's knees. And at two in the morning, when everybody had gone home, he would light a candle, sit down in his study, rub his hands and open Aristotle and have a look. The Rambam writes an enormous text that is one of the most difficult texts in Jewish thought. Uh, it's not an easy one to read. And it's very, very encompassing and very complex, but it has a very cool name. Uh, it's called Moren Vuchim, or the guide for yeah, the perplexed. Now, it's impossible. It's impossible to summarize the rumba. He's basically telling you, he's basically telling you that the Torah as a revealed document and natural philosophy, which we would call science and pure rationality, are one and the same thing. It's us who don't really understand that yet. Who are the confused? Who are the perplexed? Anyone except the Rambam. He is, in fact, prioritizing massively. And whereas I could stand here for a year and we could meet like this every week for a year and we still wouldn't get through all of the major points of Moren de Vuchim, with the title of his book in Hebrew, there are just one or two things that we need to understand about the Rambam's thought to understand the evolution of Jewish thought since the Rambam. Because the Rambam prioritizes the intellect. Human beings were born to be, to have rational intellectual projects. So much so that for the Rambam, the mitzvot themselves, the precepts, the commandments of the Torah themselves are simply pathways to rational enlightenment. And in one of his more radical moments, the Rambam would probably even tell you, as he actually does say this in certain places, that the Torah was sort of written for the masses. Philosophers, that's where it's happening. Philosophy is really the key to understanding what it is to be a human being in the world. The more you can activate your sechel hapoel, your active intellect, the more your relationship with the divine will become more revealed and enriched. Prophecy itself, the highest levels of spiritual attainment, are the result of intellectual inquiry and rational thought. The Rambam is, at the end of the day, a snob. Because the Rambam believes that your, the, your very existence in the afterlife is dependent upon your intellectual apprehensions, and he's worried about all those people too busy to actually study philosophy, he therefore writes out 13 principles that you must believe. Take it from me. Trust me, says the Rambam. These are the 13 things. And we're all familiar with the 13 principles of Maimonides, but they really come about from the Rambam because of his concern that people will not have time to arrive at this by themselves. But this is eventually what you will arrive at. There are many, many more things that we can say about the Rambam. His view on miracles as being embedded in nature he has a scientific view of miracles and of prophecy and of the Torah, of mitzvot. He accepts just about everything Aristotle tells you, except, of course, Aristotle's argument for the eternity of the world. He says no. He doesn't prove it. Aristotle can't prove that. And he goes through Aristotle's proofs, shows they're unconvincing, and says it's not that... I'm going to disprove it, but he's not proving it. Therefore, I'm going with what the Torah is telling me. I'm going with revelation. I'm going with the first verse of the Torah, in the beginning God created. So I know that before that there was nothing. This, by the way, 
is a bit alarming to some people. It was then and it is now. Now it's alarming because people think, ah, oh, creation from nothing. What we call in Hebrew, yesh me'ayin, something from nothing, ex nihilo in Latin. People think that that has always been a part of Jewish thought. But if you said to Philo, is the universe created from nothing, he would say, what are you talking about? There's matter. God meet matter, matter meet God, fudum, universe. But the Rambam, and already Sajid to some extent, but, and slightly before the Rambam, the Rambam is very, very emphatic that this is the essential understanding of the concept of creation. Prior to God's will, there is nada nada. One more Aristotelian thinker I'm going to touch upon, and then we're going to launch into an entirely different phase of Jewish thought, and that is, this is, we might call the green, the Aristotelian period. These are the Platonists. This is the Aristotelian period. The late 14th century sees just the last blast of Aristotelianism in, uh, in Jewish thought with a very interesting thinker, and I'm mentioning him because he's a highlight, really. And that is, <coughs> sitting here, is one of the most extraordinary thinkers in Jewish thought that's very, very unknown, relatively. He's more known in the non-Jewish world than within the realm of Jewish philosophy. It's a person that we call the Ral Bug. The, all these great guys are known by their initials. That's Levi ben Gershon. He wasn't just, didn't just write a commentary on the Torah, which is amazing, uh, but he was a mathematician. He's actually the first person to develop trigonometric tables to five decimal places. That sounds impressive, but it didn't just impress us, it impressed everybody. And in fact, there is a crater on the moon named by NASA called Rabbi Levi's Crater. <laughs> Rabbi Levi actually, Levi ben Gershon, has an extensive discussion of these issues, but the one that I want to highlight, because it's, it, it, it really pops out of the whole discussion in the Middle Ages on a variety of issues, and remember, in a talk like this, I can only give overview conceptual movements. I can't, don't have time to go into the individual issues. But there is a big discussion in the Rambam and elsewhere about the concept of free will. Everybody is familiar with the idea of free will. The idea of free will is that if God is omniscient, omniscient means knows everything, past, present and future, where's my free will? The Rambam, Sadia, they all tell me I have free will. I have free choice. I'm a human being. I make choices in the world. If I don't have choices, then the whole setup of reward and punishment is pointless. Where's my free will? Rabbi Levi Ber and, and this discussion. And even the Rambam, even, the, even Maimonides will tell you that he doesn't know the full reconciliation of that paradox. He doesn't know. God knows everything, but you have free will. Levi Ben Gershon comes and tells you, I am so concerned with you understanding that you have free will, that I'm rationally, and he, he spends quite some time rationally proving that God does not know. God does not know. God does not know what you're going to do. God could know, but God withholds God's the divine knowledge of the future. It's actually a tremendous parallel between that and the great transformative movement that is about to take place in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism, about the withholding of God in order to create the space for the world. If God was to know the future, it would obliterate human discourse. God withholds. This is a very, very radical idea that this to put a limitation on God's omniscience. All right, so all that's humming along. Everybody's familiar with the uh, amazing and complex history, the 700-year history of Spanish Jewry from the 8th century right through to the end of the 15th. And most people in this room would be familiar with the... Uh, tremendous cataclysm that was affected in Spanish Jewry at the end of the 15th century in the great expulsion of, the, of, of, of Yehudes Farad in, the, in 1492 
and how that transformed the Jewish world, that had many, many repercussions. What a lot of people don't realize is that the real cracks in the wall of that had already started a hundred years earlier. You didn't need Ferdinand and Isabella and Torquemada to create a massacre. And it, in the 1390s, there were massacres of Jewish communities right across Spain. In one such massacre, uh, one of the greatest rabbis uh, of the time, one of the greatest thinkers of the time, because his son was murdered in one of those massacres in awful circumstances, uh, sat down and uh, for a number of years and really attempted to uh, transform and revise Jewish philosophical thought and to put it on a footing that where, away from where he thought it had gone wrong. What most concerned this person, and I'll tell you this person's name because otherwise it's going to be tricky. He's living around here. He's writing in the early 1400s and transforms the whole picture. He writes a book called Or Hashem, which means the light of God. His name, Chasdai Kreskas. Anyone familiar with the writings of Chasdai Kreskas? I've got, to, I've, I've got to really summarize Kreskas very quickly, and, and, and it's a shame because I, I would love to give an entire talk on it. Kreskas is concerned because what has happened as a legacy of Maimonides and the whole obsession with Aristotelianism is that knowledge has been overly prioritized, the attainments of the intellect have been overly prioritized, and the whole concept of truth, spiritual truth, has been put on a yardstick that is basically measured as to how it accords with some Greek guy in the 4th century running around with a foreskin. And Kreskas can't handle that. And he says, and not only that, not only that, what was happening after Maimonides? What was happening after Maimonides? People were going, ah, oh, well, if Maimonides is telling me that mitzvot, the precepts of the Torah are really just pathways to philosophical enlightenment, then uh, I'm enlightened, I'm philosophical, uh, I don't need to keep mitzvot. Which might sound like an inane argument, but it actually is an argument that is still very much carried down till today. People say, oh look, the Torah is just a document that's trying to tell people how to live better. I know how to live well, I've got my life sorted out, I don't need the Torah. And it was alienating for a lot of people, this emphasis on intellect. He was also concerned with some of the conclusions of the obsession with Aristotle. So his basic idea, and I'm mentioning this in, in some detail because it shifts the picture, his basic project was, on the one hand, to correct some of the, correct some of these you know, tendencies, and also to set limits on Jewish thought, where it can go. He says, for example, the Rambam gives you 13 principles. I'm not concerned with those 13 principles. He says, I'm going to give you basically five or six basic parameters. You can think what you like, but here's what you've got to believe. First of all, God is omniscient. He knows the future. Whatever the roll bug tells you, he knows the future. He's also omniprovident. Your divine providence does not depend on your intellectual attainments. God is omniprovident to every individual in every circumstance. And God is omnipotent. You know those famous questions they're asked in the Middle Ages. You know, can God create a rock he can't pick up? Well, says Kreskas, any question that begins with the words, can God, the answer is yes. Free will, I'm not here to resolve that paradox, says Kreskas, but know that God knows everything and that you have free will. He actually sets up a relational paradigm. If you feel as though you have free will, you have free will. That's what's important, and you do. But that's not, all of those are interesting, but they're not Kreskas' major transformative contribution. 
And then once we understand that, then I can zoom through the last 500 years. Crescas's major transformative contribution is this. If you are going to have a discussion in Jewish philosophy, you must engage with the question of why the world was created. What is the purpose of a universe? What is the purpose of a world? The Rambam had engaged with it. The Rambam tells you, I know what the purpose of a human being is, says the Rambam. The Rambam says the purpose of a human being is intellectual attainment. The purpose of the world, says the Rambam, I don't know, that's God's business. Kreskas, who did a whole revision on the Rambam, says, no. You have to discuss the purpose of the world, even if you're wrong. Even if you're not sure, and you just want to take a stab at it, you have to discuss the purpose of the world. And as it happens, says Chris Gus, I know what it is. So I'll tell you. The purpose of creation the purpose of the existence of a world, says Crescas, is not knowledge. I'm going to shift the whole base of Jewish philosophy. It's not knowledge. It's love. It is love. God seeks relationship with other. And the divine enters into creation in order to be reflected through the souls of humanity and to set up a relationship on the one hand between God and humanity and of course within humanity between individuals. That is the purpose of creation. The relationship with other is built into the fabric of this world. Crescas went on to have a very, 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 very big student. His big student, the Yosef Albo. And Albo says, ah, oh, the Rambam gives you 13, my teacher Crescas gives you 6, I'm just going to give you 3. There's 3 things you need to believe in and then everything's fine. If you want to be normative, if you don't want to be a heretic. Right? He says, you've got to believe in the existence of God. Hello. You've got to believe in divine revelation. If you don't believe in divine re revelation, you're not really on the bus. And you have to believe in reward and punishment. doesn't matter in what form. You could believe in heaven and hell. You could believe in karma, whatever it is. But actions have consequences. You believe those three things, says Albor, you're okay. You're not a heretic. That leaves a lot of room. That leaves a lot of room. I have to tell you that even though he's regarded within the mainstream normative con tradition, and he wrote a very famous book called Sefer HaIkarim, which is an unignorable book. He does threaten a lot of Jewish thinkers and uh, conservative thinkers today because his definition of what is acceptable is so incredibly broad. He did that basically because he wanted people to realize that ideas like the Messiah and so on are so secondary or tertiary in Jewish thought that they're not really part of what is really going on. Albo, and I don't have time to go more into it, but Albo is an example of where philosophy has spilt over into wider theological contexts. But I'm going to move on and I'm going to move into the modern period. Big things are happening in the world. It's impossible to understand Jewish history without seeing it embedded in world history. Yep, Toldot Am Yisrael, embedded in Toldot Adam, to use the Hebrew terms for that. And similarly, it's, if we're talking about Jewish philosophy, it's impossible to see the unfolding of Jewish philosophical thinking unless we see it embedded in what's happening in the wider sense. And as you would know, at this time in history, the walls are coming down on the old order and the world is very much changing, changing in a great variety of ways. Uh, and for our purposes, 
we know that round about here there's a supremely important thinker who is keen, not Jewish, who is keen to break down everything and start from a conceptual ground zero and build all knowledge up from only what he can absolutely know. You all know who I'm talking about. The picture begins with what is the only thing that I absolutely know for sure. If you sat somewhere in a room by yourself, no furniture, lights off, well, you're probably not sitting if there's no furniture, you're on the floor. What is the one thing, the only thing you can absolutely certainly know is that someone is thinking. The famous cogito ergo sum, I'm thinking, therefore I am. And from that, Descartes started, began to build up knowledge. That was a very, very radical point in human thought. Because now we're really, really grounding everything away from revealed thought, even away from the thought of what we, the intellectual and rational attainments of previous generations, to build up knowledge again. That ushers in really much, pretty much the modern age, the age of reason and so on, and we go on to develop tremendous ideas. Uh, I, if, if we had more time, I would possibly touch for a moment on Spinoza. Spinoza is not regarded uh, Spinoza, who was so deeply influenced by Descartes' realizations, Spinoza is not per se a Jewish philosopher. He's more a philosopher that happens to be Jewish, although uh, for many of us who've read Spinoza carefully will realize that it is a great chaval. It was a great shame that he was uh, excommunicated from the Jewish community because he is so God-intoxicated, as some have put it, that, and his conception of God uh, was, is uh, is is really consistent with a lot of Jewish mystical thinking. He would probably, however, at the end of the day, be considered a heretic even by Albo. Uh, for Spinoza's concept of God and its pure pantheistic conception of God, his materialistic and determinist conception of reality uh, really precludes the ideas of specific divine revelation or reward and punishment and so on. He certainly obliterates any discussion on free will. Uh, Spinoza thinks you're no more free than a rock that's been thrown in a certain direction. The rock might think it's going in that direction, but that's basically where it's been thrown. Uh, Spinoza is, I'm, I'm being trivial now with Spinoza, uh, he is a very, very deep thinker that's still awaiting incorporation into Jewish thought properly. I'm going to jump and I'm going to go to here because once we get to the 18th century, is really where we see the origins of the whole of the modern world emerging. The world in which we live, and certainly the Jewish world in which we live. All of the great movements and ideas that are current in the Jewish world now really take, most of them, take their root in the 18th century. Working on older traditions, of course, but in the age of modernity. Now, <laughs> the 18th century, uh, sees the rise of phenomenal thinkers. We can't deal with them all, of course, and, but I'm looking specifically at those regarded as Jewish philosophers. There is a young man who basically walks from the shtetl and uh, turns up in Berlin in the middle of the 18th century and goes on to become the greatest German philosopher of the middle of the 18th century. He was called the German Socrates, in fact, and uh, until the arrival of uh, Kant and Hegel on the scene, was actually seen as the, the pinnacle of German thought at the time. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Moses Mendelssohn, because Mendel's impact on Jewish thought is so significant. Mendelssohn was an observant Jew to the day he died. Those people who point fingers at him and say that, you know, he was an apicurus and he was a heretic, simply haven't read the man or studied his life. But he was living, he was very proud of the fact that he had a tolerance patent from the, uh, to live in, he was a Jew who was allowed to live in Berlin because of his intellectual attainments. The 18th century was still a time of tremendous 
segregation between Jews and other members of society. People were coming, other philosophers were coming to Mendelssohn and saying to him, look, Mendelssohn, you know, you're a philosopher. You're part of the age of enlightenment. What, what, what are you doing? What are you doing with Judaism? What are you doing with the Old Testament? What are you doing keeping the precepts of the Torah? Why are you still Jewish? Why are you concerned with these ideas? Mendelssohn's response to this and, and, and to other questions is contained in a very important work called, an, a very important essay that's published as a book called Jerusalem. It's not a big book. You could probably read it in a couple of hours. But it is a very, very transformative work in Jewish thought. Mendelssohn tells you that he doesn't read the Bible for philosophical truths. The Bible is not a book about philosophical truths. It is a book about how to live. It is a book about how to be a Jewish person or how to be a Jew or even how to be a human in the world. It is a book of divine law. Mendelssohn also tells you, and this is a real kaboomba to the people that were attacking him, that the Jewish people exist in the world as an ethical project for humanity. To remind the world and to exist as a witness to the world of the whole concept of freedom. Freedom is the value. Freedom is the expression of the divine in the world. You can subjugate the whole world and you can force them to think what you want, but the Jewish people will always exist in order to remind humanity and to act as a symbol for humanity of the importance of the independence and freedom of human consciousness. That is why I keep the Bible, says Mendelssohn. That is why I am a Jew, even though I am an Enlightenment philosopher. Because we, in the 18th century, we're living on the cusp of the rise of a new phenomenon called the secular person. There's no one secular at this time. The 18th century is starting to see people who are gaining the ability to uh, not be confined by religious identity. Always remember that we're still breaking out of the medieval feudal picture of everyone has a particular status and station in life. And you know what that picture is. That picture was that at the top you have the king and you have the nobility. And then you have a, like a warrior class and you have a merchant class. And then you have a whole group of serfs and peasants who are living on the land. And then you have a hierarchy of animals and at the top of that is the, the, the lion in some senses or perhaps the horse. And after that the cows and the dogs and all the sheep and all the way down to cockroaches. And underneath cockroaches are Jews. That is really the picture in the Middle Ages. We are only just climbing out of that. And so this transformative power of Mendelssohn to understand that it is possible not just to reconcile reason with, reveal, with revelation, but to reconcile that in an individual life that you are capable of intellectual rational attainments reconciled with your ability, importantly, to live in that secular society as a Jew. All right, if the, if the 18th century really belonged to the French... The 19th century belongs to the Germans. They are amazing. And uh, Kant, uh, by the time you come to here, the end of the 18th century, we've really arrived at the age of reason, big time. Reason virtually becomes a religion in itself. And great thinkers like Kant and Hegel are working out these concepts of universal reason. It is Kant who makes the tremendous transformation that our categories of perception are internal to us. They are structured, they are hardwired into our minds as human beings. In, all, in other words, we perceive reality according to various categories and this is a, how the subjective process of being human. Uh, Hegel actually goes precisely where Kant doesn't and Hegel says that in fact, no, uh, reason, universal reason is transcendent. The logic is transcendent. It emerges through 
uh, human history in the unfolding of being through what Hegel calls his dialectic, you know, thesis, synthesis, uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. These are all very complex, big ideas. But in the middle of the 19th century, a young man comes along, not Jewish, who says, that's all very impressive. That's very, very big and impressive and complex and everyone's very excited. Oh, Kant and Hegel. But what does that all mean for me? I've tried to read Hegel, but when I read the Bible, says this young man, just the story of Abraham leaves me quaking in... Mis in, in like, what do I do? What do I do when the demands of reason and the demands of my religion conflict. That's why he picks the story of Abraham, who is told to sacrifice his son. What do I do when God tells me something and yet it's inconsistent with this big universe? What does it mean for me? I'm talking about who? Yeah, I'm talking about Kierkegaard. Now, that's, that's a very big moment. and That's already going to become a big challenge for Jewish thought. The story of the last hundred years, or the, maybe the last hundred and twenty years certainly, has been attempting to understand these sorts of revolutions in philosophical thought. Kierkegaard more or less ushers in the great 20th century age of philosophical thinking that we call existentialism. What does it mean for the individual? What is my... using not the mind as your starting point, but in fact your very being, your very existence in the world is your starting point. At the end of the 19th century, was a very big philosopher in Germany, a Jewish guy called Hermann Kohn. Now, Hermann Kohn was a Neo-Kantian, and he was the biggest Neo-Kantian uh, in Germany, a massive philosopher. And as an old man, he actually realized, he remembered, oh, I'm Jewish. <laughs> Kant had spoken about the fact that what is, because everything is perceived through the mind, so what is really going on with objects or phenomena, das Ding an sich, the thing in itself, is noumenal, it's transcendent, we cannot comprehend it. And Cohen, in his earlier career as Neo Kantian, had said, Kant tells you you can't comprehend it, the reason you can't comprehend it is because it's not there, it doesn't exist. But now, in his 70s, Herman Cohen realizes that. In fact, in fact, it does exist. It's God. And he emerges with a distinction that's become, going to become very, very important in Jewish philosophy in the 20th century between being and becoming. The grounding of being is God. The project of humanity is becoming. This is extremely influential on one of the biggest, his student, one of the greatest, probably the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Franz Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig, who writes Star of Redemption from the trenches in World War I, sets up, <laughs> sets up, tries to take the universal picture that had emerged from German idealism, the great intellectual edifice that it was, and tries to critique it by bringing it down to three basic relationships. On the one hand, we have... God, man, and not in a gendered sense, not in a gendered sense, obviously, and world. And these three entities are mediated by three fundamental relationships. God and world, of course, meet in creation. God and man meet in revelation. And man and world meet in redemption. This is the famous Star of Redemption of Rosenzweig, probably the, the most influential philosophical text. But other thinkers are coming along at the same time. Buber, Martin Buber, who is emerging also as a great essential thing. I wish I had more time to go into it. Buber is concerned with relations with people, and he realizes that the divine is revealed and expressed, and freedom and all of the other values that are important in this type of thinking are revealed through second-person relations. All our relations must be raised to the level of you. I mention that very briefly because the 
it goes on, these ideas go on, and especially Herman Cohen goes on to influence big thinkers in the 20th century like Rav Soloveitchik and so on, who talk about these ideas and bring it back down to Jewish religious thinking and the idea of being and becoming. And I'm going to just end right now with a thinker who's still alive, who I think probably history will remember as a fairly significant Jewish philosopher, Jonathan Sachs. He wrote a book uh, some years ago called The Dignity of Difference. Uh, he got into massive trouble. The, the Jewish world is very conservative today, and even if you're the chief rabbi, you've got to be very careful uh, with what you say. It was one line in the dignity of difference that got him into trouble, and that is the line that on earth there are many truths. In heaven there is one truth, and on earth there are many truths. They didn't like that. But in dignity of difference, Sachs argues that this differentiated reality in which we live with all of its corruptions and all of its pluralism is precisely the purpose of the world because it is precisely the celebration of difference that allows the concept of dignity and respect between human beings to arise. It is a complete inversion of Plato. Plato argued that this world is differentiated and pluralistic because it is corrupt. But in fact, this world is for sex this world is differentiated and pluralistic because it affords, it is a world that affords the greatest opportunity for the revelation of the divine through the concept of tolerance and dignity. I very much appreciate you listening. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, Please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.